Hi, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining today um, for this fantastic live webinar topic. Before I, I introduce myself and, and today's speaker, I do have a couple of housekeeping items I want to share with you. Due to the large size of the audience, you'll all be in listen-only mode. Um, there will be a Q&A session afterwards, so if you have any questions or things you want to bring up, then please do so in the chat function in this webinar. The session will also be recorded and you'll be given a live, uh, sorry, a link of the recording at the end uh, to be sent to all registrants. So starting with myself, uh, introducing myself, my name is Simon Barchard. I'm VP Business Development for Telegram Marine Europe. Um, thanks for joining this webinar. Um, and I'm pleased to introduce Jen Aitken. Jen is a research scientist and product manager for Telegram Optic a Teleband company recognized as the world leader in design and development of LiDAR instruments has been doing so for more than 40 years. Optic is a sister company to Teleband Marine and their LiDAR technology using lasers is a great complement to our sonar and underwater imaging technology. So that's why we brought this presentation into the fold there. Today, Jen will be sharing some of her work undertaking um, qualification of LiDAR systems uh, attempting to see if they could be used to map the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Jen. Go ahead, Jen. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. If you can't, just raise your hand. Um, again, my name's Jennifer Aiken. I work for Teledyne Optech, and I'm physically located in Mississippi uh, at the Stennis Space Center is where we have our office, but our headquarters is in Ontario. And uh, I specialize in bathymetric LIDAR, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. So the project we're going to talk about um, is an aerial expedition that went out to the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, and all the credit for this project goes to a group called the Ocean Cleanup, which is a nonprofit. Uh, this is a really important group in uh, ocean debris mapping, and uh, I'll go over a little bit about the beginning of it. This uh, happened in uh, October of 2016, but we obviously have not solved this problem. So what we found is still very relevant today. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the ocean cleanup group. I'll talk about the aircraft that we took out there and where we went and the remote sensing instruments that we put on the aircraft as, as part of the experiment and the results. So the Ocean Cleanup, again, it's a nonprofit group, and it was started by a young guy named Boyan Slat. He's from the Netherlands, and he was scuba diving one day and saw a bunch of marine debris, and having a very engineering mind, he said, I want to do something about this and dedicate my life to it. And he thought, I want to build something that's going to be deployed in the open ocean that will use our knowledge of ocean currents to maximize the amount of debris that I can funnel into this device so that it can be collected and a ship can come out and pick it up. So that was his goal. So he started this group and he uh, immediately got a bunch of very bright people joined on with him. And they started with looking at the historical record of debris and um, computer modeling. So they got a really bright couple people on the computer models determining, okay, where does the debris come from? Where is it going and where is it accumulating? And I think we know at this point that there's uh, certain portions of each ocean basin that converge currents and debris. And so the one that we went to is in the Pacific Ocean and it's thought to be the largest collection of plastic of the five gyres that exist today. So before we did this aerial expedition, um, what the ocean cleanup did was they said in 2015, let's get a bunch of boats together and go out to the garbage patch and see what's out there and start to quantify. What is it? How large are the pieces? How many are out there? So uh, Boyan went around and uh, talked to people and cold called people and raised money and got 30 boats together and went out in 2015 to the garbage patch and they collected a large amount of debris and they took an inventory of what they saw from the boats and one of the things they noticed is a huge um, amount of the debris they saw out there was in these ghost nets which are drifting nets that are floating around and just catch everything that 
the, that they come across, whether it's other debris or marine mammals, and they're very dangerous, and they collect a lot of plastic. They're really heavy, they're hard to get out of the water. So the group became interested in the ocean in, in the ghost nets and trying to figure out, well, we can see them on the surface, but how deep does the debris actually go? So they decided, well, the next thing that we want to do is do an aerial survey over the garbage patch. So they took the spotters that they had on the boats that were doing inventory and they said, let's put them in an airplane and then let's put some remote sensing instruments on there as uh, sort of in an experimental way to see if we can detect the plastic and try to see what we can see underneath the water. So I'm just going to play part of a video for you so you can kind of see. You'll see Boyan. The video starts uh, showing the end of the mega cleanup with the boats where they were collecting debris and they're thinking about what are we going to do next. So hopefully this will work. So if you've net. We need to cover an even larger area. So how on earth are we going to do that? How would you normally cross a large area? Um, well, you would jump on an airplane. So then we thought, well, what if we actually got ourselves an airplane to, to do this? Uh, thing? And uh, uh, that actually led to the first aerial reconnaissance mission of an ocean garbage patch ever. We crossed the Great Pacific Garbage Patch with a C-130 Hercules aircraft twice. We fitted this airplane with the most advanced aerial sensors in the world, which included shortwave infrared sensors, as well as the LiDAR sensors. And this is really the same technology that self-driving cars use, where we actually are able to get a sort of a 3D point cloud of the debris, through which we are also able to estimate whether it was just debris or a net at the surface, or whether it actually went down. So then we have the count, we have the volume, and through that we could actually estimate, based on the nets that we got with the mega expeditions, uh, how heavy those nets would be. And now it actually turns out that the nets that we spotted would actually comprise uh, about half of the mass of plastic out there in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Okay, so you saw that. So you kind of got an idea of what uh, the survey platform looks like. It's, it's a C-130 Hercules. It's the, really the only thing that's going to go that far out there to reach this remote location. So in even, even at that point, you still have to get all the way back. So what they ended up doing is building fuel tanks that they put in the fuselage of the aircraft, and we just worked around them. So... You know, in science, you make a plan and it always looks pretty good and geometric. And um, this is kind of the pattern that we thought that we would fly. And this is what we actually got. So what we did, uh, we flew two different flights, um, October 2nd and 6th in 2016. These are 11 and 12 hour flights. They're very long. Um, so we started out from Moffett Field in California. Uh, pressurized the aircraft and went up to 20,000 feet and flew out to the area. Then we dropped down to 1,300 feet above the sea surface. We opened the doors of the aircraft unpressurized and did the survey. We got about two, two and a half hours worth of survey before the fuel constraints kicked in and we had to close everything up, go back up to 20,000 feet and, and get back. So what we ended up with is transects of about two and a half hours long at, out in the garbage patch. So this is an example of what it looks like in the back. Once we were down at 1,300 feet, we opened up the rear doors of the aircraft. This is normally where people will jump out of. Um, so we put, uh, the ocean cleanup put spotters in each of these doors. And what they do is they do a double blind study. So there's a divider between two uh, observers. And the idea is they do a separate inventory and then you cross correlate after the fact. So there's two observers in this door, there's two observers on the other side. And then during the survey, they'll switch out. Um, you know, they're used to working from the boats, but when you're working from an aircraft, you are moving much faster. And there was so much debris out there that once we opened the doors, it was just bang, 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 bang. And they just immediately were taking pictures as fast as they could. Um, it got to be, uh, a little bit, you know, overwhelming. It was a lot more debris than than they expected to see. 
they had these gorgeous cameras. So they're taking oblique photos out of the aircraft that look like this. And you can really see in the imagery uh, what that debris is. I'm gonna show you what we did for the remote sensing instruments. We had a nadir pointing RGB camera, but it was nothing like this. It was the camera that we used was designed to be a QA camera for the LIDAR. So it was only 16 megapixels. Uh, and it really wasn't enough. What we tried to do um, was put a 100 megapixel camera on there, but it just we just ran out of time and we had to build a custom mount for this thing. So we couldn't put the high quality nadir pointing camera on there, which I highly recommend that you need. Um, and unfortunately, these oblique photographs did not overlap our nadir RGB, so we couldn't cross correlate. So here's the remote sensing suite that we put on there. In the middle, you see this 16 megapixel RGB camera. It's a metric camera, it's a good camera, it's just 16 megapixel. Um, we've since upgraded it to 100 and 150. With this camera, we got just under 20 centimeters spatial resolution. It's not enough. It's not enough to identify what the plastic is. Um, as noted, this camera is part of the seasonal system, which you see on your left. This is the green laser that we use to um, penetrate the water and try to map subsurface objects. It's called the Coastal Zone Mapping and Imaging LIDAR or CSMIL. It's made by Teledyne Optech. We're just introducing the next generation of this system. We call it a supernova. But this particular one uh, generates a laser beam at 532 nanometers and it generates 10,000 pulses per second, right? It spins it around in a circle uh, the circle, once you're at 400 meters altitude, is about 290 meters. So that's the width of the swath of data that you're getting underneath the aircraft. So it makes this circle and the forward motion of the aircraft builds up the data swath. We also put, as an experiment, a shortwave infrared instrument on there. This is made by a company in ITRES, uh, called ITRES Research in Canada. They've been making hyperspectral sensors uh, for 40 something years. They're really good at it. Um, this instrument operates in the infrared from 950 to 2450 nanometers. And I'll explain why we selected this instrument to find uh, plastic. So just to orient yourself, we are in the visible region of the spectrum for the RGB camera. Blue light is about 400 nanometers. Visible red light is about 600 nanometers. The green laser is operating at 532 in the green band. And then the shortwave infrared instrument is going to be up here just beyond the visible in the infrared with wavelengths 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7. So it's reflected light, but you can't see it. So again, this is the special mount that we had to build. This, this plane is so large, we can't, we normally just put uh, the sensors on the floor of the aircraft and there's a hole and we can see underneath the aircraft. But this aircraft is so big and um, large that we had to think of a different way. And the only thing that we could come up with is you open the back cargo door and we actually literally build a mount that we could push out the back of the instrument and hang the instrumentation out the back of the aircraft, which was a little daunting. And this is about four or five million dollars worth of equipment, but that's what we did. And it worked, it, it, it worked. This is a picture from underneath where you can look up at the sensors. You've got your RGB camera, you've got your SWIR camera, and then you've got the laser and you can see the, actually that circular scanner in there. The laser comes out at a 20 degree off nadir and it spins around in a circle at 27 Hertz. And then this is kind of what it looks like on the ground. If you're just sitting in the aircraft hangar and you point the green beam at the ground and turn it on, we put an attenuator on it. This is not an eye safe laser, so you can't blast full power while you're um, in an aircraft hangar, but this is low power and we're just checking to make sure that we get the whole circle and it works. But that's what it looks like, one single uh, partial scan. So this is what it looked like when we actually deployed it over the garbage patch at 1300 feet. After we opened the door, we pushed this mount out. Uh, the larger center head you see here is the laser and the smaller one is the shortwave infrared and the RGB camera is in front of the shortwave infrared. 
So the first thing that we started with in our analysis of the data that we collected was the air photos. Even though it's the 16 megapixel and it wasn't great resolution, we could still find things um, out there. So we wrote a program that would look at each image frame and find anything in the image frame that was different from the ocean background. So a lot of what you see out there in the garbage patch, I mean, people think of this big garbage island. We didn't see that. What we saw was just individual floating pieces of debris and then some small collections of debris around a ghost net. So this is pretty common. A big piece of highly reflective hard plastic is floating out there. So it's pretty obvious to find on an air photo. Um, it can be confused with sun glint or a breaking wave. Anything that's bright and white could get confused. So you do have false positives with this method. But what we did was we detected the objects, you assign a XYZ location to it, and then you also make a perimeter of it. So this red line is actually a digital vector file that is saved in shape format or KML. So now you know what the aerial, um, the aerial estimate is of this piece of debris in 2D. This is what a ghost net looks like on the air photo. Again, some the opposite problem is you have things that are not bright and they actually look gray or blue and they kind of blend in with the ocean background. So they're a little bit harder to find. And again, you need a really good camera with good radiometrics and a good spatial resolution. But we did find this ghost net and digitized the perimeter of it and got a location of it. So, once we knew where there were likely ghost nets, we used that to go into the LIDAR data to find subsurface objects. So this is us just building up a database. You got X, Y, you have time, you have an aerial estimate, and you have an associated uh, image file. So this is just a very brief and you know rundown of how a green laser works in bathymetry. Uh, we usually use like a Piper Navajo aircraft we're shooting at 10,000 pulses per second. This is a, a representation of a single pulse going out. It's going out at a 20 degree off nadir angle. It's gonna hit the sea surface. Because it's going into uh, a different index of refraction, it's going to a different, you know, this is, water has a higher density than air. It's gonna slow down and it's gonna bend towards the normal and the beam is gonna spread out. So essentially what we do is we send out a pulse and we get it back and we digitize the return pulse. So what you're looking at in the upper right, this is the actual return pulse. It's been distorted by the mediums through which it's been passed. Uh, we're measuring at the receiver and we're digitizing a point every nanosecond along this curve. So this is what happens to the pulse. It comes down, we start recording just above the sea surface. It hits the surface, so I'm gonna get a peak here. Then it's gonna travel through the water column and then it's gonna hit the bottom and I'm gonna get a secondary peak, okay? This area of the waveform is called the backscatter as it's going through the water. And this is an extremely important area of the waveform. We can tell a lot about the water quality based on the shape and the slope of this part of the waveform. And if there's something in the water, we're gonna get a signal along this wa uh, waveform depending on the depth that that something is at. So this is a really important part of the waveform. And initially when green lasers were invented and used 50 years ago by the Russians, they were putting them on boats, shooting them through the water, looking for submarines. So they didn't care about the bottom. They didn't want to see the bottom. They wanted to see something in this backscatter that would tell them that there was a submarine there. So this is what uh, object looks like on the bottom in a LiDAR waveform. This is a tethered mine, it's a dummy mine. It's probably two or three feet above uh, the sea floor and it's one meter in diameter. So we deployed that in Fort Lauderdale, flew over it and you see the waveform here. You get a nice surface return. We're coming through the water, looks pretty relatively clean. I've got a bottom return, but before the bottom, I've also got a blip in my waveform that tells me, hey, I hit something here. So because we know the time precisely, we know the depth that it's at. And if you have uh, several waveforms off the object, you can get an idea of the size of that object. This is just another example of what waveforms with targets look like. We take two meter cubes. Um, these are very special paint. These cubes are um, specially made for this purpose. And Occasionally, the Navy will take them out and put them at different depths offshore, and they'll fly and see if they can detect them. So this is what a cube looks like in the uh, 
point cloud, you have the sea surface, and we get the top of the cube here. So you can see the two waveforms for two different depths here and how they differ off of the same size object. Uh, at a nine meter depth, you have a much shorter backscatter and you have a stronger return signal for the bottom and also for the cube itself. As you get into deeper water, you get uh, it takes more time to get to the bottom, so you have a longer backscatter region, and then you have a lower signal on the cube and on the bottom. We can still detect this, but you get a lower signal because anything in the water column that's going to scatter or absorb the light is going to reduce the amount of energy that you have, and eventually you're going to get to a depth where all the laser energy is scattered and absorbed and nothing comes back to your receiver. In theory, our Seasmill Nova system, if you're out in super clean water that doesn't have any chlorophyll or sediment, you're going to get to 80 meters. That's open ocean. Uh, typically, if we go to, say, Fort Lauderdale on a nice day, it hasn't rained, we'll get over 50 meters depth. So that's generally where you're working at with uh, bathymetric LiDAR. 50, 60 meters is probably the maximum you're going to get. But if the water's at all dirty, then that maximum depth gets much, much shallower. So here's an actual uh, set of waveforms from the ocean cleanup experiment. You're looking in this picture at one of those big pieces of flat plastic that's floating around. In the graph here, you've got a black waveform, which is a pure water LIDAR waveform. Okay, there's nothing, it hasn't interacted with anything except for the surface. This is very deep water, so there's no bottom return. So all you get is the surface return, you get a nice slope, straight down, looks very clean, and then it just trails off into nothingness. The red curve is the waveform that hit this piece of plastic. So we're not seeing underneath this piece of plastic, but we are getting a very distorted surface return that's telling you, hey, there's something in the water at this location, just from the waveform itself. This is what a ghost net looks like in the waveform. On the left here, you see the ghost net from the air photo. Uh, we went to the LiDAR point cloud and extracted some waveforms for that location. So again, we have a black curve of clean water for reference, and then the red curve is the actual uh, ghost net LiDAR waveform. And you can see we get a good surface return, but at about three and a half meters, we've got something in the waveform that tells you, hey, there's something below the surface here. And since we know uh, the time precisely, we can figure out what the depth is of that hit. So the only way this works is if the LiDAR waveform can penetrate a certain distance into this floating pile of debris. If it's completely packed together and you can't shine a beam of light through it, then you're only going to see the top of it. There has to be some porosity to the ghost net so that the LiDAR laser light can go in there, scatter around, and come back to be measured by the receiver on the aircraft. So this is kind of an example of the procedure was we would get this perimeter from an air photo, then we would go into the LiDAR point cloud, which is what you see in the center. These red and yellow and green points are the actual surface returns. So you've got like a one meter swell of the ocean, but the blue and the purple, these are the subsurface returns from this location. And right where the cursor is, this is the waveform for that, uh, for that particular point. So you're not getting a lot of points, but you're getting something. And what we see here in the waveform is we have a surface return, but just under the surface and a little bit below that, we're seeing some structure. There's something in the water column here and it has a structure. So what we did was we actually built a 3D model of what those ghost nets were. So we get the perimeter from the air photo and because all of this is georeferenced, it's got an XYZ associated with it, uh, all we have to do is take the perimeter from the air photo, get the subsurface points from the LiDAR point cloud, and then just play connect the dots in MATLAB. And what you get now, you're going from a 2D aerial estimate of debris to a 3D estimate of the volume of the debris, which is what uh, Ocean Cleanup was hoping to see. This is another example from a different air photo. Make the perimeter, go in the point cloud, stitch it together, and get a volume estimate. So one of the things that we discovered about this that we wanted to know was how deep does this debris go that's floating on the surface? And I think one of the conclusions we made is it's not very deep. I, I don't think we saw anything below six meters in depth. So 
there is some subsurface debris, but it's floating near the surface. Now there's a whole other subject about debris that sinks to the bottom. That's a whole different subject. We're talking about floating uh, surface debris and specifically ghost nets. We also found some whales while we were out there. So we digitized those. Uh, this is a little whale family, they had a baby whale. Uh, it's just a reminder of the danger to the marine life. I mean, this is why we're doing this because there's a lot of animals out there and they're getting caught in this debris and uh, drowning, dying. So sometimes this, there is no signal. This isn't a perfect methodology. Again, if the debris is so packed in um, and you barrage the debris with laser points and nothing gets through, then you're not gonna see anything underneath it. This air photo, it looks to me like there may be some porosity in this uh, floating, I think it's a net, but we didn't see anything beyond this one point here in the point cloud. So it's either there's nothing under the surface or this is uh, a very jumbled together piece of garbage. It's really difficult to tell. And again, it underscores the need for a better nadir pointing camera because it would make it a lot easier to see what this is and what its composition is. So I'm gonna talk a little bit. So that's what we did with the air photo and the LIDAR. And then I'm just gonna mention the SWEAR instrument because it, it was uh, an experiment that didn't work out as well as the LIDAR. Why did we put a SWEAR instrument on there? It's not a normal instrument that you would use, particularly for a water application. Ocean Cleanup wanted to try it because uh, we're all familiar with these triangles um, and the numbers, and each number corresponds to this is the type of plastic that is, uh, is present, and these numbers are used in recycling to sort the plastic for, for recycling. So the interesting thing about this in the shortwave infrared is that every different type of plastic has an extremely unique and repeatable signature in the infrared. So on the x-axis here, it's a little hard to see, but we're starting at 1,000 nanometers here, so just beyond the visible. Um, well, visible stops at about 650. So we're starting at 1,000 here and going to 2,500 here, right? So that's the wavelength range of the SASE instrument here. So the idea was the hope would be that you would see something this distinct and we would be able to say, oh, that's not only plastic, it's PVC plastic. Well, the whole problem with this approach is that SWEAR energy, this works if you're right on top of the sample. This, these signatures were collected with a ground spectrometer. Um, there are some very sophisticated recycling facilities that have SWEAR sensors in them, and they actually use them in this way to separate the plastic. But in remote sensing, it just doesn't work this way because um, the SWEAR, there's a lot of atmospheric absorption of SWEAR energy. There's a few windows that you can get through, but a lot of the energy in the, in the region is absorbed, and water is a huge absorber of SWEAR energy. So when you fly over it, it's very, very low signal because most of it is absorbed. So what we found was it really just didn't work. And I'll show you a spectra from the SWEAR imagery that covers this region here from like 1,000 to 1,500 nanometers. And it's just, it's frankly, it's just, it's not good. Um, on the right here, we're looking at a two meter object one of the larger objects that we have in the air photo. We located it in the sphere over here on the left. And the sphere imagery is about a meter level spatial resolution, which is not ideal for this application. Something you're only gonna get the larger objects and you're only gonna get one or two pixels. And basically what we found is just the absorption by the water makes this not a reliable, um, method in remote sensing, which is really too bad because there are satellites that have these frequencies on them, but that's, you're even gonna have bigger pixels and more atmosphere, and I just don't think that it's gonna work. There is, you know, there's a company that makes a SWEAR instrument that goes on a drone. I don't think anyone's tried that. It'd be interesting to see at a very low altitude uh, how much absorption that you have. So again, just to summarize what worked and didn't, the RGB imagery uh, still going to be one of the most useful things that you have. You have to figure out what this stuff is, uh, and you need centimeter level resolution. If, if we were going to go out there again, I would look for something five centimeters or better uh, resolution, which you're not going to get from a satellite. 
The bathymetric LIDAR, we found it will find things on the surface and it will also find things on the subsurface if there's enough porosity to the debris. And I would also add here what we found is it didn't go very deep. We're talking about the first five meters of the surface. The shortwave infrared, yeah, it was a good idea, but it didn't work. Uh, it does work for direct measurements, but still needs some development if you're going to do things in remote sensing. I think the next thing I would try would be, you know, a very short um, altitude, like a drone, something at 25 meters and see if that was at all useful. So if you wanted to follow up on the ocean cleanup and the work that they did from their manual spotters and the inventory they took, they uh, published something in scientific reports. You can see that here and you can look it up. There's a lot of videos on YouTube regarding this project and the follow on projects that they did that you can look up. So what are we going to do in the future? Um, I think people are just going to continue to try to find things from the satellite imagery. The Sentinel constellation is pretty interesting uh, to me. It has a lot of different sensors and a lot of different parts of the, of the electromagnetic spectrum that you can try. But again, I think the issue is going to be the spatial resolution. Um, I think Sentinel-6, I just heard, is going to have an altimeter on it for measuring uh, sea surface. So I wanted to look more into that to see what the resolution of of it was going to be. Um, a lot of people are using drones um, equipped with uh, cameras. Uh, if you want to look up the University of the Aegean did a really interesting project where they put optical sensors on a drone and then they organized satellite overpasses from a couple of different satellites. But the cool thing they did was they also built targets. They built these uh, PVC frames that were 10 meter in size and filled them up with uh, homogenous pieces of plastic. So they had three different targets of different types of plastic and they did the drone overpass and they did the satellite overpass and they did some work there. And um, Ocean Cleanup also tried to deploy a drone. Drones don't stay up that long. So if you're going to be out somewhere as remote as the garbage patch, you're going to need something to launch it from. So there's that complication. But I do want to mention that there is a potential for using green laser from a drone. The seasonals are really powerful laser. Um, like again, you have to be like 290 meters away from it because of the eye safety issues, but they do make lower powered green lasers. Um, the one particular company I'm thinking of is called Astrolite. They have a low power green laser on uh, a drone. And this could work because uh, it's low power, so you really need clear water for the laser beam to get through it, but that's what you have in the ocean, ocean open ocean. And also it doesn't have to go very deep because we think the debris is, is mostly near the surface. So using a green laser from a, a drone is I think a potentially uh, next step. The other idea that we're having, we're kicking around is, you know, since we know that the debris is shallow, why not put something underneath it and point a sensor upwards and try to map it from underneath. So this isn't a very unexplored idea, but I think it's a good one. Um, buoy tagging of debris is ongoing. People are finding debris and putting um, tracking buoys on them for the purpose of continuing to refine the current models, but also maybe the hope is someday you go out there and you actually pick up that debris. The last thing I want to mention is Ocean Cleanup is uh, they're continuing their work. They, they actually built the boom, they put it out in the open ocean. You know, they immediately had some problems because it's a rough environment out there. Uh, but they're continuing to work on it. They called it the Wilson. Um, they're continuing to work on that boom, but they also have branched out into focusing on rivers. And I think this is a brilliant, brilliant idea. It's a lot easier to work in a river. Uh, you have much more of a controlled current flow. So they built this thing called the Interceptor, and it's just a floating uh, rectangular barge with a conveyor belt on it. And they deploy a boom that goes across the river and co collects the debris and guides it into the conveyor belt where it can be collected. The, the first projects that they did, uh, they focused on uh, Indonesia and Malaysia. And if you've seen any footage from those areas or been there, they have a huge debris problem in their rivers. So this has been really effective from preventing the plastic from getting to the ocean in the first place. Ocean Cleanup is estimating that 80% of the plastic going into the ocean is coming from rivers. So I think we all have come to the conclusion that once it's in the ocean, it becomes a really difficult problem to track it and to clean it up. 
and we really need to be focusing on reducing the input into the ocean from the first place. So I think this is a great idea. I think the interceptor, um, they're not the only one doing river cleanup instruments, and I hope to see a lot more of those in the future. So that's what I had for you today, and uh, I think we can open it up for questions. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Jen. So that was really interesting. So actually, I had a question for you to, to start with. Um, Jen, you in, in the plot you showed, the waveform was kind of the amplitude. Is it possible to use any other <clears throat> properties of the waveform, like phase or anything like that? Phase? Hmm. Well, like, yeah, any any other, are there other waveform properties that you could use? Maybe it's a stupid question. Uh, well, I mean, our strategy is you just get as many pulses on the object as you can. And the hope is that one of them will get through that debris. But uh, what you end up with is just a multitude of waveforms like what I showed you. So I don't know what you would do with the phase. There is one interesting thing I didn't mention, and I know microplastic is a big deal, and you'll probably a lot of you have heard this idea because plastic immediately starts to break down in the ocean and it just gets into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. And that backscatter region of the LIDAR is very sensitive to suspended sediment or anything in the water column. So the theory is, is that if you have plastic of a size that's similar to suspended solids, then microplastic should show up in the backscatter part of the waveform. So that's kind of an interesting thing because nobody really knows how to map microplastics. But you would need to have a very controlled environment in order to prove that works, right? You would have to have the laser fired through a, a container of water with a known amount of microplastic in it in order to prove this theory. So, so that to me would be a, something interesting that people should be looking at. Hmm. So, so Jen, just a, one question from the audience here from Fernando Perez. Is it, I'm going to read it ad lib here because it's a quite technical question. So the question is, what about hyperspectral thermal infrared? The energy comes from the water temperature itself modulated by the spectral emissions. Yep. Um, yeah, uh, I think that actually would be a good idea. The, the ITRES research up in Canada, they do make a hyperspectral thermal sensor and uh, thermal sensors have a lot of information in them on ocean currents. And you get a very different answer if you fly at night as opposed to the day, which is kind of interesting. So their thermal sensors are really good for finding small currents and they certainly would pick up uh, the debris that has a temperature difference. I don't know how successful it would be with the ghost nets, but obviously the plastic is absorbing sunlight and it's gonna have a temperature difference. Um, what you would need, you know, is just to, to see what your spatial resolution was. I'd have to ask ITRES, but I think they're getting down to meter and submeter resolution on their thermal sensors that they have. They have a broadband and they have a hyperspectral thermal sensor. So yeah, I think that would be a good idea to try the thermal sensors as well. And, and there's actually a follow-up question, uh, and is uh, how about fluorescence LIDAR? Would plastic fluorescence stimulate a particular laser wavelength? Hmm. That's an interesting question. There used to be a LIDAR a long time ago that NASA had called the Airborne Oceanographic LIDAR, and it was designed to stimulate fluorescence at one wavelength and then receive it at a different wavelength. I think it's it's kind of a low signal. So I, I'm not an expert in that field, so I would say I would try it experimentally first. I don't know if plastic has a fluorescent signature. If somebody knows, please say so. I know living things do. I, I don't know if plastic does. That would be my first question. It's a good question. I don't know. I'd like to find out. Excellent. Okay, so Margo, I think that was it from the questions. There's also a comment here for, for Jen on some work that, that's referenced here, and Jen will send that to you. Uh, there's some an interesting reference to some algorithms being developed that might be of interest to you. That was sent by Gordon Johnson. So thanks for that, Gordon. I'll, I'll make sure that Jane gets that. Okay, great. Yeah, and I definitely want to give all the credit to the Ocean Cleanup Group. These people are phenomenal. I, it was just a privilege to work with them. And uh, again, it's a nonprofit, but they're very successful at what they do. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining. And Jen, thanks for this presentation. It was really interesting. A worthy cause for sure. 
uh, yeah, we're definitely putting more plastic in than we were in 2016. So we're not going the right direction, I don't believe. All right, well, thank you everyone. And uh, feel free to contact me afterwards if you have any additional questions. Thanks a lot, Jen. All right, bye now. Bye then.